sometimes it really isn't best to just push through. And I, you know, I can't, I can't make a general statement about, you know, when it is and when it isn't. You know, that will vary hugely depending on, you know, the mother's physical and mental health. You know, her goal, her support network, how supportive or unsupportive her partner is, and her family and, you know, medical professional that she interacts with. You know, whether she has to go back to work and at what point and so on. But I think that. Information is the best way that I or anyone could help any parent. And we're rolling. Welcome to the Parenting Truths podcast. Today, I'm joined by Danielle Facey, also known as the Breastfeeding Mentor. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So the reason I wanted to chat today, so you support uh, breastfeeding mothers around the world in their sort of nursing journey, and you show up every day with amazing content on social media uh, sharing your motivation and wisdom. Um, But before we dive into all of that, can we maybe kick off with your own journey um, in relation to breastfeeding and how that sort of evolved over time? Um, Because I I think it's fair to say there's no straightforward breastfeeding journey and it comes with lots and lots of ups and downs, doesn't it? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Um, (laughs) An understatement. Where to begin? Um, Yeah, you're right. And the vast majority of Mums don't have a really simple, you know, straightforward nursing experience because as natural as breastfeeding is, it's not necessarily easy. And that's certainly the case for yeah, most mums and most families. And yeah, very similar in, in my case as well. Um, I like to say that my journey kind of began years before. So I know that your family has experienced miscarriage as well and how yeah, traumatising that can be. And I feel very, yeah, I feel pretty strongly that I don't know that I would have been as determined as I was to breastfeed if I hadn't experienced baby loss um, and okay. also to breastfeed for as long as I did without that experience. And I had quite a traumatic birth and labour as well. And so I just felt pretty disempowered by, yeah, the whole kind of motherhood experience up until the point where my son was born. And it almost felt like breastfeeding once we once we finally got the hang of it, was one of the few things that I was doing well and that I, you know, could do and could do for my son. It was very, yeah, very empowering, kind of restored my faith in myself, in my my kind of identity as a mother, as a woman. And yeah, it was particularly important to me after, yeah, again, a very traumatic labour, which yeah, left me feeling completely out of control. And so I was more determined than ever to then breastfeed because I felt like um, it's not a rational feeling, mum guilt, parent guilt, <laughs> rarely is. But because my, boy, my little boy was born via emergency section, very much felt like I'd let him down and, you know, I wasn't able to bring him into the world in the you know best way, that, yeah, medically, right. from a medical perspective anyway, the best, the most ideal way for him and his health and well-being. And so I felt, yeah, even more of this, yeah, desire to breastfeed. And it took him four days, took us four days to get him to latch on to me successfully. Um, yeah, I like to say that he pretty much stayed there then for about, it was three years and nine months to the day. And yeah, very much. Okay. Uh, it was intense. He was a big monster. Not all babies are, but yeah, <laughs> he loved nursing. Um I loved it too, you know, again, super empowering for me. Um, I loved knowing that, yeah, even if I couldn't get the sleep right or the naps or anything else, you know, I was able to do this and it it very much, yeah, boosted me as a mom, helped me feel confident and, yeah, helped us to bond as well. I think it played a pivotal role in my postpartum um, wellness as well, mental health. And, yeah, I'm not sure that I would have survive that period without it. I think that's another area of breastfeeding that yeah isn't really touched upon often that actually lots of benefits for mums too if it's going well and with the right support and so on. Um so yeah we love nursing um up until gosh yeah I stopped loving it when he was about three and that's when we started our winning journey. Um but yeah various challenges at various points, you know engorgement, cracked bleeding nipples, um, yeah, boobs like waterfalls, navigating, going back to work with a, as a breastfeeding mom, and very much being keen to continue that. 
Um, even though yeah, my employer at the time wasn't very supportive and just kind of brushed it aside at my kind of back to work meeting as something that they didn't really want to talk about. And oh yeah, you know, you can continue breastfeeding if you want, but yeah, don't talk about it here. Um yeah, so lots of challenges. Definitely back to work was probably one of the biggest ones. Um, I actually collapsed with exhaustion at one point, trying to navigate what was at the time a 60, 70 hour a week job with nursing my phone on demand whenever we were still together and him not sleeping very much at all when we were together. So that was probably the period of the greatest of greatest challenge in our journey. Um, and then we were hit by lockdown, which actually was a bit of a blessing in disguise for me because it gave me more time at home. And then, yeah, after that, I just, I knew that if we could survive that, we could breastfeed. And in, initially, I wanted to breastfeed until my little boy weaned himself off the breast. But I'm pretty certain he'd still be going now. He's four, four and a half nearly. Um, he'd probably still be on the boob at seven if I left it up to him, which some people are very happy with. But yeah, I was ready to have my boobs back. So <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we weaned very gradually and responsibly. Uh, ending in February, actually on Valentine's Day of this year. So, yeah, boobs are done. They've they've done they've uh, yes, <laughs> and then some. And I really did love the journey. And yeah, it sparked this account, my account, and blog, and so on. Yeah, and my passion. I think one thing to pick up on there was um, you mentioned about it made up part of your identity of who you are, who you were, or are as a mother, because. Laura, my wife, breastfed Luca for the for three years, and we've got a nine month old, so she's nine months in. Two completely different breastfeeding journeys. Mia, who's nine months, it's been a real struggle, and I think during the low moments, Laura was like questioning things and the challenging moments. But I think what dr- drove her through was she was like breastfeeding really does make up part of who I am, and I think that alone was what really gave her the drive to persevere through those. Those long nights, it's come round again. We're experiencing those at the moment where it's literally every sleep cycle, 45 minutes to an hour, she's up on the boob and she'll only settle on the boob. But we sort of know that won't last forever and and it will be worth it. But yeah, it was interesting. You said it made up uh, part of your identity as a mother because Laura said exactly the same thing. Yeah, I think, I mean, our brain, the maternal brain is, is literally shaped by pregnancy and breastfeeding. So I think it's quite naive of us and, and it's certainly naive of me as a mum to think I'd just kind of have my little boy and yes, I'd be his mum, but I wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't change who I was. But it, it, it did in a sense, it did in a way that, you know, I I could never have anticipated pre-motherhood. And I mean, I was super passionate about teaching. I loved being a teacher. I was for 13 years, super passionate about my subjects, loved the kids. And, you know, thought I expected at this point I'd be maybe a deputy head in a you know a nice little school in the countryside. Um, but then my son was born and my priorities just shifted hugely in a way that I never could have imagined. And, yeah, breastfeeding really did become, well, yeah, I call myself the breastfeeding mentor is literally my day job now. <laughs> Pretty important to me. And, yeah, I just. I didn't expect it at all. I think a lot of mums don't, but it became very important to me. Perhaps, and particularly at difficult points in my motherhood, I think I probably clung to breastfeeding, maybe not always in a healthy way, um, but again, just because it was one thing that it was going well, it was working for us, we were both enjoying it, and it felt a little bit like the whole world was against us and our journey, and and everyone was telling me like oh gosh he's nearly one now you know you want to get him off that and and I was like no actually I have no desire to do that and I'd really like to reach two years if that's possible for us and if it's not you know then it's not but I think that the lack of support from the outside world made me into this breastfeeding champion because yeah it's what I needed as a new mom I needed to know Firstly, it's okay if you love breastfeeding. You're not crazy. You're not a lunatic for loving something so natural and pure. Um, it's okay if you'd like to, you know, if you have particular breastfeeding goals. 
that's okay too. Um, yeah, it's fine that you don't necessarily want to stop when you go back to work. It's fine if you want to let your child decide. It's fine if you don't, you know. Just all of, there are so many different variables. And I feel so strongly that women are just not empowered to breastfeed on their own terms. Whatever those terms look like, whether that's, you know, you really would like to breastfeed for three days and then you're done. Whether that's three days, three years or beyond. You know, breastfeeding is really good for babies and children. So let's support, you know, mothers and families to do it. And I think it's that external pressure and noise that um, certainly when you breastfeed past a year, uh, that sort of that those that choose to choose to breastfeed, they seem to have like a real burning passion to help other mothers who are doing the same. Because I remember, I think I've mentioned it a few times on the podcast when Lucas Oewa first was just a couple of weeks old. Laura was really struggling, and so one of her friends put her in touch with a breastfeeding support worker. And it was a Sunday. She wasn't paid. She had three kids, but she gave up everything to come around to our house for two hours, help Laura with her latch. And it was that intervention that opened up three years of of feeding, because who knows which which way Laura would have gone. But it's that level of passion, isn't it, that seems to be quite um, consistent within those that um, choose to breastfeed and, you know, breastfeed into past a year. Mm, Definitely. And I think it's, it comes from our experiences, you know, that, that mum that you said Laura worked with and mums that inspired me again were, yeah, mums who breastfed beyond infancy and beyond, you know, the the constraints of societal norms and felt very passionately that they wanted to help others do the same because it was so difficult <laughs> and, you know, because we hope yeah. that other mums don't suffer and struggle and you know, experience the same stigma and so on that we did. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fire starter. <laughs> Absolutely. So what, what sort of sparked, you, you've talked about it a little bit there, but what sort of sparked your passion to start helping other mothers and set up the breastfeeding mentor? What was that journey like? Because I, I know you've only been doing it a few years, haven't you? But you've yeah. grown a big social media following and you seem to be helping parents all around the world quite quickly yeah so um again it was it was my struggle during lockdown predominantly and and returning to work and wanting support and not being able to find it anywhere so initially I I started the account to to initially I thought I might start a breastfeeding um fashion brand that that was my business idea of lockdown didn't happen okay Uh, maybe it will one day but um then I started to make notes initially just for myself and for anyone else you know any other mother any other family who I knew and loved so that they wouldn't have the same challenges that I did so just notes like I don't know normal and like infant behavior and safe co-sleeping and bed sharing um talking about cluster feeding and normalizing that and so on and I started to just make these notes on my phone as my son would nurse and nurse to sleep um, during that time. And eventually I realised that I had about 100 notes and I thought, oh, you know, perhaps I could turn this into a book. And so I did. Um, and the focus was very much on self-care. So a, a bit of a mantra that I told myself to get through writing the book was that I remember being bashed over the head with this trope of breast is best when I was pregnant. And then as soon as I had my son, I kind of added to myself, Yes, it may be best, but it might also kill me in the process. And I remember thinking, I have no idea, like, how to look after myself while I'm breastfeeding. Like, the only, when I spoke to my GP, when I quite literally collapsed trying to do the the weekly shop uh, when my son was nine months old, and my GP said, oh, just, you know, go away for the weekend. And when you come back, your son will be so mad at you, you won't want to breastfeed again. And I was just mortified, but this was my GP's advice. I just kind of sat there and cried and thought, okay, so no advice here. And, you know, for various reasons that I don't have immediate family who breastfed. And so I I just didn't know where to go for this very real, raw advice about how to look after myself and continue breastfeeding. Because, yeah, just switching to formula wasn't, it just wasn't something that I wanted and yeah felt really disempowering and yeah I just couldn't find the support that I needed so I thought you know what 
for my sisters initially. I have younger sisters, they're twins. Um, they both want to be mums one day. They say you forget everything postpartum, so let's write it down. <laughs> and then I won't forget, and they won't have to go through, yeah, the challenges that we faced. And, yeah, then started pl- blogging and posting about that on Instagram and on the website and found that the challenges I was facing were universal. You know, I've got followers in, in the US and Australia, all around the world, India and so on. And, yeah, these are not, you know, isolated um, challenges. These are common struggles from mums who are not are no longer surrounded by generational wisdom when it comes to lactation. And so they're looking for it on, on social media and online. And yeah, I'm delighted to be able to offer, you know, some kind of support. Yeah, I think one thing you do really well, like you said, is provide awareness for those seeking that information. Because as you've mentioned, there's definitely a lack of sort of awareness and education within the NHS, for example, that I know, I think maybe 2016, there were quite a lot of budget cuts for breastfeeding support. So I wondered, because I think it's really important for expecting parents to be made aware a lot more than they already are about breastfeeding, not to force them to breastfeed, but to help them make an actual informed decision. So I wondered if you had any thoughts on sort of what changes need to be made to sort of better support expecting mothers and mothers postpartum as well. Mm, I agree, yeah, wholeheartedly. There needs to be some some lactation education. <laughs> um, you know, during the antenatal classes, uh, the ones that I attended, and, you know, lots of people go to NCT classes, and I understand the push to, you know, try to convince parents to breastfeed. But to me, we are, it, it's, it's quite cruel, actually, to to tell parents breast is best and to shove this message down their throats and then not actually prepare them for the realities of breastfeeding. That, to me, yeah, is really unfair because, yeah, I mean, the guilt that then ensues, you know, that sometimes lasts a lifetime, if people are not able to breastfeed, it's just, it's really sad and it's entirely preventable. You know, not every family is going to want to breastfeed, not every mother will want to breastfeed. Wonderful, you should be empowered and supported to start formula or use donor milk from day one. And you should know how to do that, where to go for information and so on. And obviously because formula, the formula industry is like a multi-million dollar industry, that information is available, you know, from various formula producers. You know, no one gets paid if your breastfeeding journey goes well. Um, And yes, it, it benefits it does benefit wider society and, you know, and our collective health. But, I mean, who who has a vested interest in that, if not us, on an individual level? Um, but, yeah, we urgently need more lactation education. Just understanding, if parents had an understanding of what normal, biologically normal infant behaviour was, was going to be like, the fact that you might have heard of night two syndrome, for us it was more like night five, and I, I honestly thought there was something wrong with my son because he was just on me constantly. I thought, oh my gosh, you know, something's the matter. I sent my fiance to like, I don't know, six different pharmacies, pharmacies, poor man, in the middle of the night. And he was just kind of cluster feeding, trying to bring my milk in. Um, I just had no idea. And I would have been so much more confident and, you know, so much less anxious if I'd known ever. I'd so he's doing that thing where he nurses loads to increase my milk supply. Just simple things like knowing how breastfeeding works on a supply and demand basis would, yeah, I think would hugely increase breastfeeding rates because so often I hear from moms all over the world who say, you know, I haven't got enough milk. How am I going to increase my supply? And I'm asking, okay, what? So why is it you think you don't have enough milk? Oh, my baby was nursing for two hours at a time. How old are they? Eight weeks. Okay. Actually, as long as they're producing enough wet and dirty nappies, you're not in pain. That's completely normal. Um, there's nothing wrong. You don't have to supplement with a bottle. And if you do introduce the formula when you don't necessarily want to, that then will have an adverse effect on your supply, which again, <laughs> many parents just don't know. And yeah, so then they get into this vicious top up cycle and yeah, end up stopping way before they want to, up to 90% of mums in the UK stop breastfeeding prematurely which I think is just really sad um so yeah just a little bit of education 
would go a huge way towards improving breastfeeding weight rates and postpartum mental health, I think. Yeah, and talking about GPs for a second, I know it's impossible for them to know absolutely everything, but if they were to have a base level of knowledge about breastfeeding, like I've got so many examples of, I think when Laura had mastitis with Luca, the advice from the GP was to stop feeding off the boob for a week and um, oh revisit goodness. it in a week's time. But obviously Laura being Laura pushed on with advice she seeked from people that she knew and respected. So she ignored that advice. Yeah. Um, my mother-in-law recently had mastitis and, um, she ha- she's got a three month old and she was told she needed to stay overnight in the hospital, but the baby wasn't allowed to stay with her. So she had to medically discharge herself from the hospital and refused to stay. It's that lack of um, knowledge that it, unless these people are seek, have got the support around them that can override the medical advice, you know, that's just going to lead to the breastfeeding journeys coming to a premature end, isn't it? Indeed. It's shocking that, you know, this is advice from medical medically trained professionals. And I appreciate that general practitioners are general practitioners, you know, they're not supposed to be experts in any particular field. But if we're talking about the biological norm for feeding human babies, (laughs) I think the least that we should be expecting is, you know, a a basic understanding of lactation, of, you know, conditions like mastitis, of thrush, of being able to identify if a baby has an oral tie, you know, just so much trauma and pain and, you know, just unnecessary anxiety. And so there'd be so fewer health issues, you know, issues with babies gaining weight that if doctors had just a basic understanding. And yeah, I, I, I appreciate that doctors are stretched. So are midwives and nurses, you know, to breaking point, many of them. But the, I understand that it's, there is no minimum requirement for lactation education um, when a, a, a doctor goes to medical school, a, a trainee goes to medical school. Um, in the US, it's three hours. The, there is no minimum requirement in the UK, which I think is absolutely shocking. And particularly when GPs will often give advice, which is actually detrimental to a mother and a baby's health, like, For anyone who's listening who thinks they might have mastitis, the advice is the complete opposite, you know, to what Laura received. Actually, you really need to keep nursing to try to, yeah, increase the milk flow and and relieve the the tension and engorgement and so on. That's only going to make things worse. So if GPs don't have a basic understanding how to treat such common breastfeeding issues as mastitis, Oh, well, I mean, it's no wonder rates are so low after six weeks. I know. Yeah, it'd be interesting to, to, to see the stats of how many sort of consultations there are with GPs for breastfeeding issues, because um, I imagine they are quite high because, yeah, the support is close to non-existent, isn't it? Indeed. And after I was speaking at a, a baby show, this was last year, and an expectant GP approached me about how to get her breastfeeding journey off to the best possible start. And I just said, oh, you know, what, what, what is it you do? And she said, oh, I'm a GP. I thought, goodness. Mm. And you, you're asking me how to get your nursing journey, yeah, off to a good start. It's, yeah, I was incredulous. And, yeah, she explained, you know, mums come to me all the time and I just kind of refer them to um, the breastfeeding helpline or the breastfeeding network or the Association of Breastfeeding Mothers or someone like that. Um, yeah, I think we're doing mums and families a disservice if, if that's what we're doing. Mm. And it, it's not, it, even those that have successfully breastfed, uh, breastfed for a long period of time still need that support. Because I remember when Mia was born, because Laura had said she breastfed Luca for three years, the midwife sort of assumed like she'd have it covered. But Laura quite interestingly said that sort of you her memories of breastfeeding was sort of breastfeeding a three-year-old that sort of just like stands up on the boob and she completely forgot how to breastfeed sort of a newborn baby. And of course, every baby is completely different. I think you mentioned it earlier, but Luca was a bit of a boob monster. It would settle him for anything, even if he just needed to calm down a little bit. But Mia is a a lot more efficient. She's just on the boob feeds. It doesn't seem to provide her that level of soothe 
as it did with Luca. Um, so sort of, yeah, even though Laura, when Mia was born, had breastfed for three years, it was like she was starting all over again, which was quite interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that I remember reaching out for support when my little boy was about six weeks old and was told, oh, sorry, there's no support after this point. Well done. And I thought, ah, oh, hmm. And yet the NHS recommends exclusively breastfeeding for six months and then for two years or as mutually desired, you know, by mother and child alongside solids. And I just thought, OK, so what now? <laughs> yeah, it's it's really sad. It's a sad state of affairs. And the fact that we don't even know, you know, the government doesn't even bother to check, you know, whether mums are breastfeeding now. The last infant feeding survey was in 2010. So, you know, the statistics we have now are over a decade out of date um there's just so little care but you'll still see you know posters plastered with breast is best around gp surgery so the onus is on the mom and yeah i think it's fair to say it, it is moms um uh i don't know i don't know how you feel about that tom about you know if did you feel like you were responsible for for helping your wife to breastfeed did you i don't know if you felt that pressure of that breast is best message because I know I did and my fiance was a bit he was a lot more relaxed about it to be honest yeah I'd say I was I was quite relaxed it wasn't pushed that that hard for us and we sort of had no sort of concept of how we'd feed well Luca would be fed and the, the breastfeeding journey was just sort of a natural progression and then as Laura continued breastfeeding, we sort of explored the world of breastfeeding and realised it was sort of we realised the benefits sort of after the fact, like, you know, a month into feeding Luca, for example. Um, but but now I'm more consciously aware of it. Absolutely. With, during Mia's pregnancy, all of the breastfeeding promotion does stand out a lot more because you're aware of it. Um, so, yeah, I imagine new parents do feel that level of pressure um, which, you know, is counterintuitive when there's not the support to help them with it. And o- on that note, in terms of the challenges, the, the the saying goes that never give up a breastfeeding journey after a bad night, mm. um, f- from what um, Laura's been telling me. So I wanted to see if you had any tips for, because I mentioned earlier, we're sort of in the throes of a challenging period because, you know, Mia's first tooth has come through mm. quite recently, mm. The other night she bit Laura quite badly twice and it was a real low moment where, Mm -hmm. you know, we were questioning the feeding journey, but but Laura's pushing through Mm -hmm. and, you know, navigating with very little sleep. But I I wondered if you had any tips for, you know, people that you've worked with that are really struggling to help keep them motivated and to continue through, certainly if they're feeding within that first year. Yeah, I think... I, I would say actually, you know, sometimes it really isn't best to just push through. Um, and I, you know, I can't, I can't make a general statement about, you know, when it is and when it isn't. You know, that will vary hugely depending on, you know, the mother's physical and mental health. You know, her goal, her support network, how supportive or unsupportive her partner is, and her family and you know, medical professional that she interacts with. You know whether she has to go back to work and at what point and so on. But I think that information is the best way that that I or anyone could help any parent. And for instance, knowing that pumping is an option, potentially. Um, you know, if a mum is really struggling, um, maybe with her latch or the, the baby's latch or biting or, or something like that, and knowing that the silver cups, for instance, are great for healing sore, cracked or bitten before, yeah. um, looking for yeah advice on how to get baby to stop biting um and yeah considering potentially pumping to supplement um breastfeeding you know at the breast combination feeding and so on um i don't think it's always best to just push through and yeah i I just i don't think that anyone can and should make a blanket statement like that because you know for instance, if I could go back to myself at nine months postpartum, when again literally collapsed with exhaustion, I wouldn't tell myself to stop, but I would tell myself that. So you know, this is how you can safely co-sleep. These are the minerals that maybe you're lacking in that 
will help you to feel better, to sleep better when you are actually able to sleep. And yeah, that will help you to feel more human. Um, you know, here are groups that you can speak to where other mums are breastfeeding beyond a certain point. And I would, I would encourage myself to seek support and support from someone who's unbiased as possible. <laughs> um, we all have our, um, you know, our biases, but you know, hopefully everyone has a friend or a family member who they can talk to and just be really honest with about what the challenges are and who can maybe signpost them to, you know, where, where they can get help. I think, yeah, that's really important because that, it just doesn't exist at the moment for the vast majority of people in the UK. And, you know, not everyone can afford to hire a lactation consultant. You know, I certainly couldn't on maternity leave, that, you know, pay is abysmal. Um, but just knowing that there are services out there like the Breastfeeding Network, the Association of Breastfeeding Mothers, there's a fantastic new app called Anya, A-N-Y-A, which is particularly for people who are struggling with latch issues. Um, yeah, myself, <laughs> yeah, anyone breastfeeding beyond infancy and just navigating, yeah, the various challenges I think we need to be informing mums and families and empowering them to make the decision because, I, yeah, I just don't think it's right. I don't think it would be right for me or anyone to tell someone, you know, no, you've got to push through or you really should push through and here's how you should do it. No, actually, you need to evaluate what your goals are, you know, what your needs are as a mother, as an individual, <laughs> um, you know, what resources you can draw on within your network, and yeah, then make an empowered decision that way because yeah, I don't know anyone's individual, so everyone's individual circumstances, and I don't uh, yeah, I don't think that preaching is support. I think there's a lot of that that happens um, within the kind of lactation space. Um, I like to call myself a lactivist because I am incredibly passionate about breastfeeding, about the benefits, and so on. But what I'm more passionate about is individual women and families making choices that are right for them. And sometimes it isn't best to continue. Sometimes it is. And yeah, sometimes it isn't. And that's not only OK. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful if you can make a decision that's right for you and your family. Mm. Yeah. I th and also, I think Laura's found... Um a lot of help via a number of private Facebook groups as well, because if people are struggling to find that support, just even if you're not actively engaging in the group, just, you know, searching the group quite often, if you see that someone else is navigating through the same challenge and then you scan through the comments and see how that challenge played out, that can help in itself, can't it? Absolutely. Just having a community. The one caveat I would say that is, a, you know, just because one thing works for one particular mother and child doesn't mean it will necessarily work for another. And so you, you do have to take advice from Facebook groups with a pinch of salt um, or just, you know, just be aware that, you know, not everyone in this group is necessarily an expert and they don't know, again, your unique family circumstances or what might be going on with a mother physically, mentally and her child as well. Um, so I'd maybe just, just check <laughs> rather than, you know, yes, use them as a, a basis for your community, particularly if you don't have one in real life. Many of us yeah, didn't and don't. Um, just maybe get that checked with, again, one of the organisations that I mentioned, you know, that are impartial and just offer advice to help you breastfeed. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on was uh, when people come to the point where they decide to start weaning, because I, I know... Um, when Luca, just before he turned three, Laura made the decision um, to, to start weaning, but it was quite natural. Um, it was more through the night. If um, Luca was looking for the boob, we'd maybe just redirect him. And eventually Laura got emotional, I remember, when she said it's hard to actually identify when that last feed was because, you know, when he actually did stop asking. So I think she's going to be more consciously aware with Mia when that comes around. Um, so I, I don't know, again, I know this is probably an impossible answer because there's so many sort of variables, but I don't know if you had any tips for people to, w when it comes round to weaning, how to sort of go about it gently oh, if they're struggling. I think, yeah, first and foremost, I think 
important to establish that you are truly ready and it's not just external pressures that are yeah making you think that you know you're half knowing because you're yeah. going back to work or you're going away on a trip or something like that um because yeah then that will just lead to resentment and guilt later on um but if you are super passionate and you know yeah i'm ready you know i've done i've done my bit i'm ready to have my boobs back now um i would yeah absolutely go slowly take my time um communicate with your little one from as young as six months old you know babies understand a, a range of facial expressions so even if they don't understand the words that we're saying they can feel you know our emotions through the way we hold them our tone of voice and so on so from as young as six months start to communicate with your baby about the fact that you're not they're not going to just nurse forever <laughs> you know there is going to be an end point and start to introduce some some boundaries at points just so that your your baby or your toddler realizes that oh right sometimes mommy says no to the boob because yeah particularly if your little one's been nursed for three years on demand that might come as a bolt out of the blue and they think oh you know <laughs> you know the first time I said no my poor little boy had a a proper, you know, full-on tantrum. Um, he's particularly spirited and, yeah, was very attached. So it was to be expected. But, you know, just introducing the concept before you introduce any boundaries, I think, is important. There are lots of lovely weaning books out there to to do this. And even just, like, pointing out the fact that, I don't know, watching uh, In the Night Garden, Iggle Piggles, and he's just lying down and he's being rocked to sleep instead of being nursed or, you know, from a child at the park or, you know, little Alfie's fallen over and he's hurt his knee and he's having a cuddle to feel better. You know, no boobs, no milk. Just, again, just introduce the idea that at some point the milk goes away and, we you know, we don't nurse anymore. And then gradually introduce boundaries and then, yeah, increase those boundaries, limit the feeds. And, yeah, once... Feeds get to a point where there's there's only one or two in a day or a night. Just be aware that, yeah, your child might initiate um, weaning at that point and not ask necessarily. Um, so, yeah, maybe just be aware of how you might like to mark the end of your breastfeeding journey. You know, a piece of jewellery, a, a photo shoot, a, just an, I don't know, a selfie. You know, there are so many different ways that you can just, you can capture a, a snapshot of that. Um yeah, so that it doesn't just pass you by and, and actually you wish that you had some kind of some kind of recording of it. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah. Important tips. And I, I was going to ask in terms of like sort of the questions you get asked, would, would weaning challenges be one of the most popular questions that people come to you with or is it more during the journey? Absolutely. So probably the ones I get the most, um, things like, so, so how long do I hold a boundary before... I just give in. How long will weaning take? You know, how long? No, should I? Oh gosh, some people give her what I think is horrendous advice. Like, you should just put chili or lemon juice on your nipples. Like, good grief! I yeah, I wouldn't ever recommend that. Um, I don't. I, yeah, how quickly should? How quickly should it? You know, I'd be weaning. When's the best time? And so on. And yeah, there is no. There's no one way fits all. Um, you might have one idea about how weaning will go and your, your child might have a completely different one. But I think if you're passionate about it being a gentle and responsive process, then going slow, communicating, layering comfort associations and so on, it, they're all essential because, yeah, responsive parenting is, is about that, that conversation, isn't it? And that give and take and not expecting our children to just be robots. And um, I think... Yeah, for me, what the reason why I developed my kind of weaning guide and webinar was because the weaning support that I'd found kind of had this almost sleep training kind of approach that was just not for me. And it was kind of a get weaned quick approach, which, you know, I knew was never going to work for us. Um, and, you know, I intentionally went very slowly, almost stopping at one point, stopping the weaning process at one point. Because my own hormones were all over the place. And just to give myself a bit of a, a chance to, yeah, kind of get my head around what was happening. And, yeah, it, it was it was a learning curve. It was a steep learning curve. But it was in very intentionally slow. And, yeah, that, that was right for us. 
Um, I know that some people will have a particular deadline in, in mind. Um, I would I would probably recommend, you know, particularly if they're passionate about it being gentle, that they let go of that, <laughs> not necessarily have a fixed date in mind because, you know, their little one might self-wean before then or it just might be really challenging to start by that particular date. Um, and unless you're desperate to start by then, you know, it's not necessary. Cool. Well, thank you for that. And have you got any more information on your weaning workshop? Is that available on your website? Yeah, absolutely. So the breastfeedingmentor.com. I have a guide, cool. a webinar and regular workshops and do one-to-one consultations as well because, yeah, <laughs> I desperately needed the guidance and, yeah, I appreciate that many people do too. Yeah. Cool. Um, so before we close out, I just wanted to move away from breastfeeding for a minute and just ask you three quick fire parenting questions, if that's okay. Yes, of course. So the first of those questions is knowing what you know now, and it can be breastfeeding related, what parenting advice would you give yourself before you became a parent? Oh, gosh. Besides go to bed. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I would tell myself, I'd direct myself to the kind of gentle, conscious parenting community that I have now found, because I don't know if you've ever heard of, um, I think the book's called something like Sleeping Like a Baby, this famous like Gina Ford book from the 80s, which I devoured when I was pregnant. And, you know, some of it didn't sit right with me then. <laughs> but then as soon as my son was born, I thought there's no way on this earth that I'm going to be leaving my son to cry himself to sleep, you know, till he's sick. That, yeah, never going to happen. So I would burn yeah. the books I had and redirect myself to authors like Sarah Ockwell smith And um, i tell myself to find you and, you know, Greer Christianbaum and... Yeah, and so on. Yeah, I direct myself to people who are parenting and who want to parent in the way that, that I feel is intuitive and, and responsive and peaceful. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like those old school books are still doing the rounds, which is why I'm quite, because I'm quite a, just a regular bloke. I'm quite passionate about sort of bringing all of these amazing voices and sort of just sharing them with as big of a wider community as I can I can build. So yeah, the, the it's good to sort of bin off those old school levels of thinking, certainly the Gina Ford type books. Yes, definitely. Uh, second question is, what's the one thing you feel you need to work on personally as a parent? Oh, um, what do I need to work on as a parent? Being more present. Definitely. Okay, yeah, that one comes up a lot, um, yeah. Not wishing that my son would sleep through the night all the time or that he'd always feed himself at the dinner table because I'm, I'm aware even you know he's four and we only have one little boy but I'm aware in his short lifetime of how much of it I wished away just wishing he'd sleep through the night because it was hard as oh it was awful at the time and I really struggled with that sleep deprivation in the early years but actually if I'd been less concerned about you know, trying desperately to make him go to sleep. I mean, nothing worked, you know, and trusted that actually he really would get there in his own time. Then I could have relaxed a lot more. And so, yeah, actively working on being more present. Um, yeah, worrying less about what others are doing and the clubs and things that they're enjoying it for that my little boy just isn't yet. And trusting that, yeah, when he's ready, he'll let me know. I just have to listen to him and, yeah, enjoy this season as it is because before I know it, it will be gone and, yeah, we'll never get that back. Yeah, I think that that resonates because our oldest, uh, Luca, he's five and a half and I've noticed between the ages of four and five and a half, he's developed so much and it, all of those worries and pressures, I remember, even silly things like a lot of his friends were riding a bike without stabilizers at three, and he's only just recently, yeah, I know. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he's he's only just recently learned to do that this summer when he was five. Um, like you say, like eating with a knife and fork, all of these things that were really like pressured in the moment 
you know, when he was four, like they'll all get there in their own time, won't they? And then even like things like swimming without armbands and stuff like that. So yeah, all of that undue stress and pressure is yeah. is unnecessary. Yeah, completely. <laughs> it's ridiculous, isn't it, when you think about it and put it into context. So yeah, just so they're worried about potty training and all of that. It doesn't matter. He'll get there when he gets there and I'll be right with him every step of the way. Absolutely. And um, the final question, which might be an impossible one to answer, but it's what's the best thing for you about being a parent? Oh, goodness. Aside from my son? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's him, undoubtedly. He's just the most wonderful human being. And it's interesting because he's he, he's taught me so much more than I could ever have imagined. Um, he's very much like me and his dad in different ways and he's he's shone a light on the parts of me that I found difficult to love but because they're packaged in him yeah he's he's helped me to love myself a lot more as well which yeah again never expected um he's wonderful he's funny and smart and bright and bold and fantastic with boundaries which I never was so yeah He's, yeah, he, he's the best part, undoubtedly. Oh, amazing. Thank you for that. Thanks for joining me today. I think when I started this podcast, I wanted to try and um, open the conversation of breastfeeding and share that with more dads because I don't think it's spoken about enough, even if, you know, someone can take one positive message away from this conversation. Um, yeah, thank you for your time and I hope it can help someone. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Tom. I really appreciate yeah, you as a dad taking such a vested interest it means the world so yeah to any dads listening honestly your support is worth its weight in gold so yeah yeah really appreciate it cool well thanks for joining me and we'll chat very soon thanks take care tom cheers bye